Unemployment, bankruptcy, homelessness, a global economic crisis. Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about our global economic recovery? Exploring the impact and seeking solutions, United Nations University presents UNU Conversation Series, The Economic Crisis. Welcome to this edition of the UNU Conversation Series on the Economic Crisis, organized in connection with the June 2009 UN Conference on the World Financial and Economic Crisis and its Impact on Development. I am Jean-Marc Quaco from the United Nations University. And with us here today, we have Professor Thomas Poggi. Thomas Poggi is Leitner Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs at Yale University. He's also Research Director at the Center for the Study of Mind in Nature, University of Oslo, and Professorial Fellow at the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the Australian National University in Canberra, uh, Australia. Uh, so, Professor Poggi, you are really covering the whole globe with your different appointments. So, uh, Professor Poggi is uh, here with us today to talk about the effect of the economic crisis on uh, global poverty and issues of uh, global justice. So it seems to me that over the years, Professor Poggi, you have been, uh, uh, your work uh, has been very much focusing on, on three main issues, of course, all related. The first one has to do with global poverty, uh, what it is, how it should be measured, and how it has been evolving over time, uh, particularly in recent time. The second issue over the, on which you have been working over the years is, I believe, uh, how powerful countries, especially powerful Western countries, have responsibility in existing global inequalities. And thirdly, I think that another theme which is at the core of your work is what would it take conceptually, normatively, and politically to really have global justice more realized than it is the case today? So in light of this constant conscience of yours, uh, and this is how we will begin the conversation, if you don't mind. What is your take on the, on the current uh, international economic crisis? Well, the current crisis highlights one more time the, uh, how dangerous it is to keep a very large number of human beings very close to the subsistence level. Uh, we should remember here that in ordinary times, even before the economic crisis and financial crisis has hit us, we had somewhere around 80 million poverty-related deaths each year. So lots and lots of people are living on the brink of starvation, more than a billion people. And the economic and financial crisis of recent years, in conjunction with uh, the increase in food prices uh, that already preceded the economic crisis that we are now facing, uh, have uh, increased that number quite tremendously. So many more people have become unable to meet their basic needs. But the reason why the crisis has hit the poor so hard is, of course, because there are so many people who are so desperately poor and living on the very brink of starvation so that even a minor change in their economic situation can uh, throw them into life-threatening conditions or uh, even just kill them prematurely. And in precisely in, uh, over the course of the past year, have you uh, looked into the numbers uh, in terms of uh, the, the negative impact that the crisis is having on these uh, very poor people? I mean, uh, have the numbers increased? Uh, well, that depends on who you ask. If you ask the World Bank, they will say, well, the poverty is always decreasing, but it's now decreasing at a slower rate than it would have decreased if the crisis had not happened. But if you look at the food and agricultural organizations of the UN, they have just made, uh, just in these days, made a very remarkable announcement, namely that for the first time in all of human history, the number of people who are chronically malnourished will exceed the one billion mark. So we have a very sad record. That number of chronically malnourished people has basically been around 800 million pretty constantly throughout the 90s and uh, the early years of this millennium. But in recent years, the last two or three years, it has shot up. And it has shot up for two reasons, as I said, for the reason of the increase in the food prices, which are partly driven by increased use of biofuels. So agricultural use gets diverted from food production 
to fuel production, and secondly, through this financial crisis. So the latest figure that the FAO is publishing is a figure of 1 billion, 20 million people who in 2009 will be chronically malnourished. And so, so yes, uh, the numbers are definitely going yeah, up. So, the, so the, the, the numbers are, are going up, and, and I'm sure that you are following uh, how the international community member states are, are handling the uh, management of the crisis. Do you feel that this crisis is going to be an occasion for us, I mean, for the international community, to really try to rectify the, the, the structural problems which you identify in your, in your, in your work? Of course, it's a wonderful opportunity to do that, and I think that it's an opportunity in, in two different ways. We have two structural crises built into the existing institutional architecture. One crisis is the one I've already mentioned, namely that poor people are essentially left out. Mm -hmm. The rules of the game are designed by the rich, for the rich, by the powerful countries uh, as uh, driven by their most important corporations and interests on the one hand, and uh, most the most powerful international agencies on the other, which are essentially controlled by the rich countries. And the interests of the poor are not considered in designing that institutional architecture. Now, what we see here is a global financial crisis that is not for the benefit even of the rich. And that, I think, should drive home to intelligent people who are our leaders in politics and economics that we are playing here a very a difficult kind of game in which we have a collective action problem. Mm -hmm. If we continue business as usual, where uh, powerful agents can buy themselves pieces of the rule structure, then we have a collective action problem where large corporations, important governments, will buy themselves, will design in their own to their own advantage, bits and pieces of the global institutional architecture with the result that the overall architecture becomes incoherent, becomes mm -hmm. worse for everyone than it would be if it were designed for a common purpose. And so that is another structural problem, a structural problem that has the structure of a prisoner's dilemma of a kind of collective action problem that I hope will make even powerful agents understand that it is not a good idea mm -hmm. to give powerful agents too much control over the design of the institutional architecture. So, so in essence, you are saying that uh, being self-centered is uh, self-defeating, not simply for the poor countries, but also for the powerful countries. And, and yet, That's it right. seems exactly. that it is it seems that it is so difficult for 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 uh, for poor countries but also for people like you who care about uh, a sense of justice the global label it is so difficult to really make the case uh, in, uh, in 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 intellectual terms let alone in political terms i mean somehow the message doesn't seem to to really go through so what is your explanation to this for, for, for this? Well, the explanation is, uh, I think, with regard to the first structural problem, the explanation is quite simply that people don't care. So mm -hmm. powerful politicians, powerful leaders of corporations, rich people, they do not care about how many people are starving, how many people are dying from lack of medications, from diseases, from hunger. Uh, and you can see that most clearly in a situation like Rwanda, if you remember in 1994, the genocide, uh, you had 800,000 people slowly hacked to death over a period of three months, and everybody was watching. Everybody knew what was happening. It was every day on the evening news. It was in the newspapers and so on. And everybody just said, this is not my concern. I am not going to do anything about it. So that's, I think, the, the fundamental point about the first structural problem. With the second structural problem, I've got more hope. Because there I feel that rich and powerful agents, many of them lost a lot of money with this crisis. Mm -hmm. Some people gained money, of course, but a lot of people lost a lot of money. And that means that they themselves will see that maybe an institutional architecture that is up for sale to the highest bidder uh, is not something that is in the, even in the collective interest of the very rich. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do here is we have to restrain ourselves. We have to accept restraints on ourselves in exchange for other rich and powerful agents accepting similar restraints, and we have to allow the international institutional architecture to be designed for some common purpose. And of course, the common purpose that the rich and powerful want 
is that it should serve their collective interests. Mm -hmm. But here, I think we, the publics of the of the wealthy countries, we have to enter and we have to say uh, we have to at the very least try to design this international order, ensure that it gets designed in a way that protects the objects of the human rights of everybody on earth. I mean, human rights fulfillment is not a very high standard, and it's a standard that at the current level of economical and technological progress, we can very easily meet. Uh, and yet, so, so you are saying that there is, uh, there is uh, uh, it's a question of self-interest and it's a question of responsibility when it comes to, to rich, powerful, developed countries to really, you know, address these issues. And yet it seems that uh, within developed countries, uh, the interests of all are not aligned. I mean, you may be right, uh, uh, a lot of individuals may have lost a lot of money with the crisis, and yet, you know, the, the main culprits, the banks in the end, you know, uh, their losses are being uh, compensated by your bailout. So, you know, how do you argue about, uh, how do you think this uh, issue through, that is to say, the fact that within developed countries, uh, you know, the, the, the main uh, actors responsible for what has happened, in the, in the end, maybe are not paying for the consequences of their actions. Yeah, you're completely right. And that, of course, sets altogether the wrong signal for the future, namely, Uh, the message to the uh, big investors, to the banks, uh, to the people who hold responsible positions in these financial institutions and also the big corporations, the message is uh, you take a gamble. If it goes well, you'll be celebrated and extremely rich. If it goes poorly, you'll not be celebrated, but you will not be poor. You will still uh, do relatively well. You'll still have a golden parachute. You will still be in happy retirement somewhere. And so there isn't really any uh, downside risk, any substantial downside risk that would deter these people from continuing to practice what they've been practicing all along. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that the current crisis is really helping us in deterring the kind of corporate conduct that has got us into the crisis. So the solution must come at a different level. The solution must come in politics where politicians, partly driven by voter discontent, will say that we can no longer sell out to these businesses and banks and allow them, essentially, to set the rules under which they operate. Mm -hmm. In the US, you can see it most clearly. In the US, uh, laws, regulations are for sale. Mm -hmm. They are for sale in the halls of Congress, where rich corporations give money for re-election campaigns and buy themselves the political support they need to get particular legislation through or to block legislation that they don't like. You also see it in the regulators where you have the revolving door phenomenon where people who work in industry at a very high salary then take on a position in a regulatory agency at a much lower salary where they regulate the very company that they used to work for and then five, ten years later they go right back to that company, take a job there and get very well paid in recognition of the fact that they did a good job while they were regulators. So in essence, you are calling for a, a political culture uh, which would be geared towards a, a strong sense of civic responsibility, both at the top and also among the population, and this both at the national level and at the international level. But, you know, having in mind that to a certain extent, uh, uh, banks, Wall Street uh, owns the political process, at least in America. So how do you once again you know, address this issue of, of ensuring that uh, uh, power is at the service of democracy and not the other way around? Well, we have here a coalition, the possibility of a coalition of two different groups. One group is ordinary people who are paying the bill, ordinary citizens of the United States, of the European Union. They are paying a very large bill for the irresponsibility of their politicians and of the leaders of their economic and financial systems. On the other hand, you also have people within this leadership, economic and financial and political leadership, who also recognize that this sort of crisis and the instability that the crisis signals are not even in their interest. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that actually we would make more money if we didn't have these high risks, this proneness to crisis. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have more to fear from the 
rule purchasing activities of other privileged agents than we have to gain from our own successful rule purchasing activities. So it's better for us to accept these restraints so long as others are also subject to the same restraints than it is for us to continue this free for all where anybody can just go to the Congress or can go to the regulators or can go to the negotiators in international negotiations and say, I would like to get this rule implemented, I would like to get that rule abolished, and so on. So that system is a system that really doesn't serve even the ends of the rich and privileged as well as they had imagined that it would. And, and you're absolutely right, and at the center of it all is the issue of legitimacy, because in the end, as the saying goes, with, with great power comes great responsibility, and with great democratic power, comes even greater responsibilities. And, and if you don't really fulfill or have a sense of these uh, responsibilities, of these great responsibilities in a democratic setting, it's the whole legitimacy uh, of, uh, of the national polity, of how it is being organized, and uh, of the international system that this you know, great national polity, the US one, underwrites, which is in question. Yeah, it certainly is in question, but it was in question well before the crisis. You know, that's what I keep emphasizing, that anybody who had eyes to look could see that the world economy was organized in a way that predictably, very regularly, very predictably killed 18 million people every year. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who had eyes to look knew that this system was an illegitimate, deeply illegitimate system. These deaths are not in any way necessary, right? Mm -hmm. The poor half of the human population has between 2 and 3 percent of global income. And in order to meet their basic needs, maybe they would need 1% more of global income. So it's entirely possible, very easily possible, to rearrange global institutions in such a way that we don't have this enormous death toll and this enormous suffering among the world's poor. And in light of the magnitude of uh, this underfulfillment of human rights, uh, the system was clearly illegitimate to begin with. Mm -hmm. It's just that now people have woken up when it hits their own pocketbook even the somewhat richer and more affluent of us wake up and they say, well, wait a second, what a system is this and where is it driving us? Another thing that one should mention in this context is also the ecological damage that we've been doing, which I think is also contributing to the clear recognition that the system is an illegitimate one, right? It's completely unsustainable. Everybody now understands that. And within 20, 30 years, uh, we will have a much less habitable planet than we have now. And of course, who will pay the bill first and foremost for that? It's again going to be the poorer half of humankind. Mm -hmm. But do you really believe that uh, people are, have uh, woken up? Because, I mean, you know, once again, I'm not an economist, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, reading the press, watching TV, listening to, to, to people, I have the feeling that uh, uh, we are very much well on, on the way of going back to business as usual. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I've, reading from the same sources, I think that there is a very considerable danger of that. And of course, there are lots of people, very influential, powerful people in the media and politics and economics and finance who are working very, very hard and spending lots and lots of money to create a sense of saying, oops, this was sort of a minor blip. Don't worry about it. The system is basically sound. Uh, the, we don't need to make any kind of fundamental changes. And that, I think, is something that we have to counter steer. We have to say uh, this system is in crisis, has been in crisis for a long time. And if we continue with the system as usual, then this crisis will just be a minor foreshadowing of things to come. Much greater crises will hit us in the next 20, 30 years because resources will run out. And so you will have a desperate struggle for resources with, uh, between the most powerful agents, the Chinese, uh, the West, over whatever oil remains, whatever mineral re remains, and so on. And the people who will, in the end, not get any resources, will not have electricity or clean water or minerals or oil or energy, uh, are again going to be the poor ma uh, majority in uh, South Asia and Africa and so on. Mm -hmm.
And it seems to me that as a philosopher, as someone who is also uh, a political scientist, uh, what you are trying to do in terms of making the case for, for, for change intellectually uh, is about uh, saying two things. First of all, the way we are uh, functioning at the moment is not sustainable. And second of all, you are telling us, in fact, uh, uh, to, to have a, a, a structural commitment to justice uh, makes also sense from an economic point of view, right? That's exactly right, yes. So what we have now is we have a system that is run by very powerful agents that have a very short-term orientation and that are locked in a kind of prisoner's dilemma where mm -hmm. nobody can afford to be public-spirited because that just allows other very powerful agents to take advantage of them and to change the rules for short-term advantage in their own favor. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do, ordinary citizens, both in the rich countries and, of course, in the poor countries, what we have to do is to try to design, redesign the global institutional architecture with a more long-term point of view, where we look 10, 20, 30, even a century ahead and try to work out a system that is sustainable over the medium term. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that, the only principles on which to base such a system are principles that, uh, that are morally informed, that are principles that say we have to achieve human rights fulfillment at the very minimum, and we have to try to ensure that the system serves the interests of all human beings. It's a collectively beneficial system rather than a system where bits and pieces are designed for the special interests of this or that or the other powerful agent. But how do you bridge the, 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 the gap between uh, you know, what should be uh, the norms and, and reality? What kind of advice, as, as, as a philosopher, as someone who cares for justice, what kind of uh, practical or, or methodological advice uh, would you give to, to citizens, to intellectuals, people who are really quite eager to, to, to have the world being you know, a better world and who are looking for ways to really counter these powerful forces which are committed to the status quo and to uh, you know, uh, inequalities within and outwards? Uh, the only thing I can say is that uh, you mentioned citizens and that is where we have to start, right? Politicians will not, on their own, take the long-term view unless that is in their own interest, of, in their own interest in retaining their own political position and so on. So it is the task of citizens and it is the responsibility of citizens to try to put these issues of global justice and sustainability on the political agenda. And actually, with sustainability, uh, it has been quite successful. And I hope that we can replicate that success also in putting global poverty on the agenda and then as citizens pressure our governments to take that seriously and for example uh, with regard to the Millennium Development Goals which is, I'm not a fan of them but it's the best we have and so we have to hold the feet of the politicians to the fire and say look you made this promise of halving world poverty by the year 2010 and so the very least you have to do is fulfill this promise. It's a very uh, diluted promise. It's a, a very half-hearted promise, a very minor promise, which you could have easily done much better. But at least you made this promise, unambitious as it may be, and you have to fulfill it. We cannot have hundreds of millions of people continuing to live in poverty, even above the quota that you have set for the year 2015. Do you also think that universities, teachers, professors have also in resp a responsibility in trying to, to train better the, the, the next generation and especially the next uh, generation of elites? I'm always surprised to, to see how the people who are running uh, these banks are, have been training the best universities uh, in the world in America and, and somehow uh, they are more committed to their own self-interest than to the wealth uh, or the, the prosperity of the nation as a whole. So, in this regard, what do you think are the responsibilities of, of uh, elite institutions of higher education, of professors, in making sure that, you know, uh, people are going to be running the country uh, uh, 20 years down the road, are going to be more committed to their uh, fellow citizens than seems to be the case today? Yeah, very good question. Of course, there is such a responsibility, and, uh, but the problem is this, that you have at the elite universities, you are teaching values, you are teaching about global justice and human rights and so on, but that's not where these people that you mentioned, namely the leaders, the future leaders of finance and the economy and politicians, that's not where they get trained. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. They get trained in the economics and the business schools, the economics departments and the business schools, and there they get a very different training. Namely, they are told that modern economics has solved all the problems of crises, of poverty. This is all a thing of the past. Poverty is melting away like snow in the summer sun. And within a few years, this will not be a problem anymore. A rising tide lifts all boats and so on. And so economics departments and business schools are not just conveyors of knowledge. They are there too, and how to get ahead and how to make a lot of money. But they are also very effective conveyors of ideology. And so when you talk to people who are leaders of finance today and have been trained in these institutions, you find them completely unaware of the magnitude of the global poverty problem. And you find them full of erroneous views about how well the world economy has been working, how it has been helping everybody, and so on. Now, why does that happen? I think it happens because economists and business school professors are living up to their very image of the homo economicus. Yeah. Right? They're always telling us in economics classes that human beings are uh, maximizers, maximizers of their own self-interest. And as it turns out, very few people are, actually. You are not, I am not, most people are not. But business school professors and economics professors actually are. So they come closest to their own image, their, their own ideal type of the homo economicus. And so they essentially convey the ideology and the values that they are most paid to convey, right? An economist who says the present system is in crisis, it's very dangerous, we have to do a fundamental restructuring, such an economist would not make anywhere near as much money as an economist who says the present system is wonderful, it's actually helping the poor, it's doing a lot of good, and so on. And that's why you get, uh, at least at the top level of sort of global institutional analysis, you get from economists a grotesquely ridiculous analyses and statements about what is happening in the world and how these institutions are doing a lot of good. So, so, so precisely against this uh, background, uh, Professor Vogi, why not make it mandatory uh, for for people who are in the depart in departments of economics uh, in business schools to really take classes in philosophy? Why not to make it mandatory for philosophers to not simply uh, introduce uh, these people to the value of ethics, but also to to demonstrate that ethics, the, the, the doing doing the right thing, is also one way to really pursue uh, uh, optimal economic efficiency. Yeah, I think that is what we have to do. And uh, I agree with you. It would be a good idea to make that mandatory and to take that initiative. But again, the question is that you asked before, how does one make that happen? How does one mm -hmm. make that happen within universities, for example? So I've recently switched from uh, to Yale University. Yes. And uh, I found Yale extremely receptive in that regard. Uh, Yale is a very interdisciplinary environment in which we work together much more closely than at my previous university. So across from philosophy to the law school, to the school of public health, to the business school, to the economics department. So I hope very much that something like that can be made to happen and that Yale can be a leader in working out these synergies across the different disciplines. But it is hard work. It has to be established. And mm -hmm. initially, Uh, economists are not particularly receptive, right? They have mm -hmm. had a very good life, a, a very well-paid life, singing the praises of the existing economic system. And so they have to relearn, they have to understand that they have to look further ahead at larger time spans, they have to think about sustainability, they have to look closely and very empirically at what is really happening to the world's poor. They can't just take uh, the numbers of the World Bank as gospel, which say that the poor are becoming less and less numerous all the time. But is, isn't it also the case because the ones who are running the show intellectually and uh, and uh, economically are also people who are never really exposed to uh, to the pain that uh, uh, economic failings bring about to people? That's right. They're certainly not exposed to that, but they are intellectuals, they are academics, and so what we can Uh, do, how we can get them involved is by saying, look, the intellectual output that you're producing is fraudulent output. It is not true that poverty is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And the methodology that is being used to deliver that result 
is a methodology that doesn't hold up, that doesn't meet minimal academic standards. Mm -hmm. So I think the way to get at such people is through the academic enterprise, where there is at least there are certain values of academic integrity and truth that are still with us and that we can mobilize in order to deconstruct these ideological productions that give us a wrong picture of how the world works and a wrong picture of the effects of global institutions on ordinary people. And, and after all, you know, at the very core of a healthy way of conducting economy is a non-economic uh, notion, which is trust. And when this is gone, then uh, all is gone. Indeed, that is indeed right, yes. Uh, on, on, on a more specific point, I know that in the past uh, two or three years you have uh, refocused a bit your work on issues of public health so uh, and uh, you know access to to medication for for people so how is the crisis affecting uh, this segment of the population this type of issue on which you are now uh, focusing yeah i mean this new focus on access to medicines is uh, has really uh, occurred as a result of the trips agreement which was uh, concluded in the mid 1990s as part of the foundation of the World Trade Organization. And essentially what it did was it globalized the patent regime that had become customary in the US and other rich countries so that now pharmaceutical innovators can take out 20 year monopoly patents, not just in rich countries, but also in very poor countries, which means essentially that poor people in poor countries have no access to advanced medicines until these medicines finally come off patent at the end of the 20 year monopoly patent period. So the problem with that is that, of course, you have lots and lots of poor people who are suffering from a large variety of diseases. And now these people can't even hope to protect themselves against these diseases because they have no longer got access to advanced medicines that solve these problems. So, and what the crisis will do, to answer your question, is the crisis will aggravate that in two different ways. On the one hand, the causes that lead to disease among poor people will be aggravated because people have less food, less clean water, uh, worse environmental conditions, and so on. So all the factors that are driving the high disease burden in the poor countries are aggravated. And then secondly, the possibility that poor people have to protect themselves through medicine, through doctors and nurses and so on, that is also shrunk. So people are at greater risk and they have less means to protect themselves. And so obviously what we are seeing is an increase in disease, an increase in also death and suffering from disease. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, in, in light of the uh, likely negative impact of uh, the crisis on access to, to, to medicine for poor people, are you uh, retailoring a bit your analysis of the, of the, of the problem and, and uh, are you uh, uh, putting forward a number of recommendations for, uh, as a way to really try to ease this negative impact? Yes, I mean, the, the main uh, proposal that I've been making in the last few years is to complement the international patent regime with a second track on which pharmaceutical innovators can be incentivized. And this is the Health Impact Fund. It would be a fund that is funded with maybe $6 billion annually to begin with, uh, money coming from the governments of rich and poor countries alike. And the Health Impact Fund would offer to register any new medicine and if a medicine is decided uh, to register, if the innovator chooses to register the medicine, uh, then they get health impact rewards for a period of 10 years. So the first 10 years that a medicine is on the market, it gets rewarded on the basis of its global health impact. The downside is that the innovator has to guarantee that the medicine will be sold globally at the lowest feasible cost of production and distribution. This would give us a stream of new medicines, especially for the diseases of the poor, where not much money can be made on the patent track, uh, a, a whole set of new medicines that would be available immediately at very low prices. And it would also give the innovators of these medicines powerful incentives to make sure that they are actually available to the poor people in poor countries and that they are optimally administered, that their doctors and nurses, 
proper instructions and so on, the so-called last mile problem. So I think if we had something like the Health Impact Fund, it would be a very important complement to the patent system that would greatly reduce the negative impact of the TRIPS agreement that the TRIPS agreement has had on poor people worldwide. We are reaching the end of, uh, of our conversation, Professor Boggy. Perhaps a, a last question. You know, you, 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 you teach on, on, on three continents. You teach in America, you teach uh, in, in Europe, uh, in Norway, you teach in, in, in Australia. You also have uh, strong professional and personal contacts in Asia and China. What you see as an intellectual, as a teacher, uh, in terms of uh, interacting with your uh, colleagues, with your students, does it make it uh, optimistic about uh, the, the future in terms of trying to push uh, forward uh, the, the global justice agenda? Uh, I am very optimistic on the basis of interactions that I have with students in China, as you say, but also in the United States. I mean, it's really fantastic to see so many young people to take these problems very seriously and to devote a very substantial amount of their time and energy to learning about these problems and trying to help solve them. Mm. But the problem is that as these individuals grow up, their individual efforts will not really be able to change anything systemically. So if the institutions remain in place, the institutions will continue to exert a very considerable headwind against the efforts of these good people. So most of these people who are idealistic and full of goodwill, they go out and they start working for an NGO or they start working for an international agency and they really do good. But all the good that they do is essentially overwhelmed by the negative impact of these institutions. So if we don't have institutional change, then we may have thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of very good people doing very good work that will be drowned out by the much more powerful effects of these institutions. I once used the slightly nasty image of pissing against the wind. You know, Even thousands of people pissing against the wind, it doesn't stop the wind. And it will make a small difference, an important difference, but it will not be enough to really fundamentally alter the problem that very large numbers of people are living on the brink of starvation. Which so leads what me we to, need, which we leads need me to, to mobilize my... these people. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. <laughs> what I'm saying is what we need to do is to mobilize the idealism and the goodwill of all these good young people to mobilize that for structural changes, not just for good work that mm -hmm. counteracts the effects of bad institutions, but for structural institutional changes that will lead to a lasting uh, change of the equilibrium point, a lasting lifting of the living conditions of the global poor. So which we need to focus the energies of these people on institutional change. Which perhaps leads me to my final question. How do you ensure that the people, individuals, uh, as they grow older, continue to be committed to, 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 to learning, to growing, and, and therefore to, to positive change? And, and how do you, if they continue to, to, to work in this direction, how do you mobilize this uh, positive forces that institutions themselves become committed to, to, to uh, learning, to growing, and to, to deliver you know, positive goods. Yeah, Jean-Marc, uh, this is, I think, is a little bit of a catch-22 situation. Yeah. Uh, you are right to suggest that a lot of people start out being very idealistic and full of goodwill when they are young. And then if you look at them 20 years later, they have become jaded and essentially are seeking their own advantage. They're in some comfortable business position and so on. So how does that happen? And I think it happens largely because there is no success. They feel, I have worked when I was young, I've worked on these things, I've given time to Amnesty International or to Oxfam or to some NGO or whatever. And uh, basically, what have I really achieved? You know, today there are as many poor people as there were 10 years ago. And so I've, yeah, I've worked hard, but I've nothing to show for my efforts. Mm -hmm. Now, to some extent, of course, that's an illusion because there are individual human beings who are better off as a result of what you did. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to see that when you also are confronted with millions and millions of people who continue to be desperately poor. 
-hmm. So people basically feel uh, it was in vain. I didn't achieve anything. The world is still as bad. I haven't really changed the world. The world is as bad as it was before. Mm -hmm. And so it's better just to participate in feasting on the world. Forget about the future. Forget about the poor. Let me just have my slice of the cake. Let me have uh, two nice children, a large house in the mm -hmm. suburb, an SUV, and let me just uh, participate in leading the good life so long as it's possible. Mm -hmm. Now, the way in which that would end, I think, is if we had real successes, small successes. So if something like the Health Impact Fund could be implemented, then we would say, here's a structural change. The Health Impact Fund will be there in perpetuity, and it will produce a stream of new medications that will be available immediately for the health needs of the poor. That is a change that is visible, is very large, is structural, and acts as an exemplar as a paradigm case for how we can gradually transform the global institutional architecture. And that, in turn, would give many people a sense of saying, this really does work, we really can make a difference, and a lasting difference. Listening to you, I'm just following, I'm just thinking about the following. It's already, it's already very, very difficult to be a hero or to be heroic in times of war. But based on the difficulties you just outlined, you know, one has to think that it is equally, if not perhaps even more difficult to be a hero or heroic in times of peace. Yes, it is more difficult and it is also in a way much, much more important because in times of war, all energies are focused on the present. Mm -hmm. In times of peace, at back, and we can mm -hmm. think more broadly and say, what is really happening here? What will the world look like in 2050 or in 2100? Mm -hmm. And what do we want the world to look like? Do we want to have 18 million people die from poverty-related causes in 2050? How much overpopulation do we want to have by that time? Because, of course, poverty breeds overpopulation. And so the problems of poverty even though many poor people now die, but the problem will stay with us for a long time to come because the world's population will uh, equilibrate to a much higher level if we don't do something decisive about poverty now and so on. So in times of peace, we can think more freely, we can think more openly, and we can really try to think critically about the institutional architecture and what to do about it. And, but it does take a certain heroism, I think, and so I hope there are heroes out there who will support me in this. It does take a certain heroism to say, look, we are doing fine. Uh, we have enough to eat. We are economically well off and so on. But we have to be mindful of our responsibilities, and we have to step in and try to change these institutions now before they uh, kill yet further millions of people in the poor countries. So in other words, in, 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 time, in times of war, because the, the, the present is unbearable, addressing this present by definition means preparing the, 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 a better future. While in times of peace, because the present is bearable, we can endure it. But in the process, in fact, we, we deprive ourselves from a better future, right? That is right. Yeah, that's right. So the time to think about institutional changes is the time... Uh, are ordinary times where things are peaceful, relatively stable, and so on. And that's where uh, there are the greatest opportunities to make the transition to a better institutional scheme. But of course, in those times, the people who, are, who have the power and the possibility to make these changes are least interested in change. They're saying, why should we change? Everything is, is very fine, you know? And so the economic crisis that we've just experienced, I think, should wake us up and should wake many people up and say, uh, this system that seems fine on the surface really is unstable, and it's a system that we should proactively try to reconstruct in a way that makes it more stable and more serving the public good, the common good of all human beings. Professor Pogib, we have reached uh, the end of our conversation. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your insights. Uh, Professor Poggi is Leitner Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs at Yale University and presently is in, uh, in Australia doing research at the Australian National University. So, Professor Poggi, thank you for your time. Uh, I, I certainly value uh, your, uh, your, your insights and I hope that the audience uh, will uh, enjoy our conversation. Thank you. I am Jean-Marc from the United Nations University.